Hey guys, welcome to unit three. In this unit, we only have four chapters, chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14. In this first chapter, we're gonna do membrane structure. So we're gonna talk in this first topic about lipids and how membranes are structured and what their job is. And in the second topic in this chapter, we're gonna talk about membrane protein, the carbohydrates, and all the other components that go into it. So I expect this chapter to be a little bit of a review. But at the same time, it may be fairly new because you probably haven't actually addressed membranes directly in any of your previous classes. You may have just discussed their presence. So as I said, for this topic, we're just going to talk about the importance of membranes and then some of the components of the lipid bilayer, which is the main component of the membrane. So we're going to go through a little bit of these things and talk about this fluid mosaic. So here are our objectives for this topic. As always, I expect you to have these mastered by our exam. Please let me know if you have any questions about these and we'll talk about them in class a little bit more. So you have talked about membranes before. In your previous classes, membranes are not something that should be a surprise to you. And you should know that membranes, the point of a membrane is to keep some stuff in and some stuff out. That's the point of the membrane. It's going to help regulate what comes in and it's going to help send stuff out of the cell. But Big thing is it just creates a division, and that's the point, is to create that division between the cell and the external environment so that, the, in, so that different processes can occur within the cell. Now, there are three main roles of the membrane. Receive information. This happens through receptors and pores, and we'll talk about those in a couple chapters from now. Import and export of molecules. Once again, pores um, and through endocytosis and other processes like that. And then they also help cells move. Now, not a lot of our cells don't move regularly, but we do have some cells in our body that even move, as well as there's you know prokaryotic cells and other unicellular organisms that move regularly. And so it's really important to understand that. Now, all membranes are made of a phospholipid bilayer, which is two layers of phospholipids, and we're gonna go through what those are here in a couple slides. But more importantly, this is known as a fluid mosaic meaning that it's got all those phospholipids, but it's also got proteins and carbohydrates and other lipids within it that move around a lot. It doesn't, it's not a stable environment. It moves, it flows, it doesn't keep a constant shape. So it's really important they understand that. It's one of those things that we get stuck in thinking that, you know, like how we think mitochondria are always orange. It's the same with membranes. We think they're stable things that aren't moving. And it's really important to remember that they are moving. They're constantly in motion. And, that, and so that's the big ideas about the cell. Now we're gonna do a little bit of a refresher on osmosis. Now you should be very familiar with this by this point in time because you should have done some experiments on this in your previous class. Osmosis is important because osmosis, or because water can freely move across the cell membrane. And this is why the environment that the cell is in is so important. And while physiological saline and, and making sure that we have the right salt concentrations in our blood is so important because it can alter our cells dramatically. And that's because the water can freely cross those membranes. So remember, in a hypotonic solution, where the, um, the solute concentration on the outside of the cell is less than the solute concentration on the inside of the cell, the water is going to freely flow into the cell. And because we don't have cell walls like plants do, our cells will burst. Normal isotonic allows the water to freely move in and out even in even amounts. And then in a hypertonic solution where the um, solute is greater on the outside of the cell than on the inside, the cell will shrivel up. In animal cells, once again, we don't have the cell wall, so it's very detrimental. We can't come back from it like a plasmolysized cell in the plant. I put a couple of videos on osmosis in um, Blackboard, so if you, have any, if you need to see some reminders on it, but it's just really important to understand that while we talk about the membrane being the selective membrane, um, it's still, water can still transfer across easily. All right, so let's talk about the lipid bilayer now. So in this little section, we're gonna talk about what it is, how it forms, how it's made, things like that. So what is the lipid bilayer? The lipid bilayer consists of two rows of phospholipids joined tail to tail. So you can see the phospholipid on this slide here. Every phospholipid is very similar. Now your book goes into the different structures of the different types of phospholipids. Don't worry about that. What I want you to understand is the basic structure of the phospholipid. You have the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tail. The hydrophilic head is going to always point to the liquid side of the membrane. So it's either on the external side of the cell 
or on the cytoplasmic side of the cell, because this is the side that likes water. The hydrophobic tails will always be pointing towards each other on the inside because they do not like water. And so it's really important to understand how that works. And so the little oval is usually consisting of um, a choline mo moiety and the phosphate group and a glycerol. And that's the phospho part of this, whereas the tail usually consists of lipids. They're long, unsaturated fatty acids um, with the kink in one in the, for the sa unsaturated. The fat, uh, saturated will be straight. And so you can see that here on this diagram. So if you have any questions about this, let me know. But this is the main structure. It's really important you understand that. Understand what's going on to make the head hydrophilic, what's going on to make that um, tail hydrophobic. So how does this happen? If we were to put a bunch of phospholipids into water, it would naturally form a phospho or a bilayer because of the way that the properties of these uh, molecules work. There's a side that wants to be near the water and a side that doesn't. And so they will always form this lip, uh, this layer. Now, sometimes they form micelles, which is a circular section of it, but this is how this works. So it will always create, and it's a natural thing. Now, remember how I talked about how it's fluid. It always is moving. These little guys, these phospholipids, they're moving throughout the membrane regularly. They will diffuse across the, um, they'll diffuse across the membrane on their own side with the lateral diffusion. They'll move around, they'll spin, they're doing all sorts of movement. And that's that mem or that fluidity that we're always talking about. And that's just part, part of how these, uh, the properties of these molecules. Temperature can play a big role in it. If the temperature gets too warm, they're going to move around a lot more, which can make that membrane leaky. If it gets cold, they can become um, static and not move as much. And that's where cholesterol comes in and plays a role. But we'll talk about cholesterol in a little bit. The Fluidity is also dependent on the length and the types of those tails. The shorter and the unsaturated fats, the more fluid um, are more fluid than longer tails. And that's just because if you think about how they pack, that's um, it, the more they can pack, the less uh, the less fluid they're going to be. So we want them to be pretty fluid in this because we want them to be able to move, but we don't want them going crazy where they become leaky. So it's really a careful balance that we have in the fluidity of the membrane. And it's really important to remember that they're always moving. Now, they can flip-flop from the uh, cytoplasmic side to the extracellular side, but it doesn't happen very often. But they do spin and move around within themselves, and this moves proteins around on the cell surface and everything like that, so you can see how that all works. Now, there's always going to be asymmetry in the membrane, especially on the plasma membrane and the outside of the cell because the outside of the cell has to have cell receptors and specific events happening. And this is called that extracellular space. It's really important to understand this because we're going to talk about how that plays a role later when we get to exporting um, from the Golgi apparatus and how this all works. And there's the cytosolic side. So the membrane is not identical. It's similar on both sides, but it's not 100% identical. There's going to be a variety of changes across them. So just be aware of that. To wrap up this topic, we're going to talk about how these membranes are made. They don't just come out of thin air. What, um, If you remember back to when we talked about the parts and the organelles of the cell, we talked about how the ER is responsible for lipid generation. And this is what we need. This is exactly what it's time to talk about it. The ER is going to be responsible for making more phospholipids for the bilayer. Now, this could go to any organelle that needs more of them mainly the plasma membrane because the plasma membrane has a lot of budding off that happens and we'll talk about that when we in later chapters but they have to be replenished and so what will happen is the ER lumen will generate these phospholipids and they're going to get added to the cytosolic half of the bilayer and then there's an enzyme called flipase that will then flip half of them or flip the extra ones onto the other side to create that even symmetric growth of both bilayers now remember when it's being built they're symmetrical once all the components of the cell get added, or the components of the membrane get added, that's when it becomes asymmetrical. And at that point is when uh, directionality matters. The cell has to keep track of the cytosolic side and the non-cytosolic side. Now what gets a little confusing about this is that the cytosolic side of the membrane is on the outside when it's in one of the uh, organelles, so the Golgi, the ER, etc. When it's on the plasma membrane, the cytosolic side becomes the inside of the membrane. And you can see a picture here 
with the dark red line showing where the cytosol excite is and that light red line being the um, extracellular side. So you can see how that kind of works, but it's important that the cell keep track of that because as it's building things to send to the membrane, it needs to be able to keep that directionality so that when it gets to the membrane, the proteins are on the right side. So this is the end of topic one. When you're ready, um, go ahead and go on to topic two for membranes and we'll get started on the other components of the membrane besides the uh, phospholipids.